The next item of business is a statement by Keith Brown on the Minister of Defence basing reforms. The Cabinet Secretary will take questions at the end of his statement. There should therefore be no interventions or interruptions. I'll call Keith Brown, Cabinet Secretary. Ten minutes, please. Presiding officer, Scotland is a society that uh, holds the members of our armed forces in high esteem. We have a long and proud history with the military. Many of our military sites stretch back hundreds of years and are deeply embedded into local communities. On Monday evening, the Defence Secretary announced his plans to reduce the size of the Defence Estate. His announcement was long anticipated and followed a period of extreme uncertainty in many communities across Scotland. The Defence Secretary announced that the future laydown of the three services in Scotland will be concentrated on existing bases at HM Naval Base Clyde, RAF Lossiemouth and Lucas Barracks. These are described as regional hubs. However, the scale of the cuts in Scotland are much harsher than were expected. The Defence Secretary confirmed eight sites for disposal in Scotland, reducing the size of the Defence Estate by almost a fifth. Proposed sites for disposal are Fort George in Inverness, MOD Caledonia in Resyth, Glencourse Barracks in Pennycook, Meadowforth Barracks in Stirling, Craigie Hall and both Redford Barracks' sites based in Edinburgh, and as well as those RM Condor Airfield in Arbroath. Timescales vary, with most sites intended for disposal by 2022, but with longer lead-in times for the Army to vacate Fort George and Glencourse by 2032. Scotland's defence footprint has therefore been hollowed out through successive cuts, so the severity of this fresh round of cuts comes as a real shock. It also comes just three years after Philip Hammond announced the last Army basing plan billed as offering stability and certainty. These recent commitments to Scotland have, for the most part, been disregarded. I'll turn to the impact on individual sites. Fort George. A garrison for almost 250 years will be vacated by the Army by 2032. As well as severing historic ties, this also represents a near total removal of the Army from the Highlands, a traditional recruiting ground. Initial estimates by Highlands and Islands Enterprise indicate that over 700 jobs could be affected directly and indirectly. Highland Council estimate a loss of approximately £20 million from the local economy. Fort George is an historic property in the care of Scottish ministers, operated by Historic Environment Scotland under a memorandum with the MOD. Yet despite this direct interest, the MOD failed to keep its promises on consultation. Urgent discussion is now needed to establish the financial implications. The Minister of Defence's claim is that Fort George is not fit for purpose as a modern garrison, not least because they have failed to invest properly over the years and will now struggle to bridge that gap. However, the cuts have also been extended to Glencourse Barracks, a state-of-the-art facility home to over 500 personnel from two Scots, the Royal Highland Fusiliers. The announcement proposes that the Army vacates the site by 2032. I know this will be of particular interest to yourself, uh, presiding officer, as it falls within your constituency. Uh, Glencourse, as you will know, has had a garrison for almost 150 years, and a loss on this scale will be a major blow for Midlothian. It's a modern, fit-for-purpose barracks, popular with the Army. I visited it myself recently, and I expect very serious questions to be levelled at the MOD about the logic of their argument in relation to this facility. Meadowforth Barracks, Stirling, and both Redford Infantry and Cavalry Barracks have been listed for disposal by 2022, with no clarity on where Army units will go. Interestingly, more than half, the bulk of the Royal Regiment of Scotland, will now be changing its location. That is the contempt that's been shown by the UK government in terms of the stability and the certainty for our armed forces personnel and their families. The MOD has long struggled, of course, to dispose of Craigie Hall in Edinburgh, listed again for disposal for the third time. So it begs the question whether these barracks will actually yield the financial savings that we are told are required, or whether they are simply generating uncertainty for personnel and communities. Incidentally, the barracks at Stirling also include the DIS Vehicle Maintenance Unit. In the case of the city-based barracks and in the case of RM Condor Airfield in Arnbroth, I would encourage the MOD, even at this late stage, to engage with the local authorities and the Scottish Government to discuss the practical impact in a constructive way, something they've singularly failed to do to this point. At the Defence Secretary's remarks to the House of Commons treated the impact on Fife, I think, extremely carelessly. Both his statement and the accompanying strategy doc document fail to acknowledge that closure of MOD Caledonia will mark the end of the Royal Navy's presence in Fife. MOD Caledonia is a mixed site housing a variety of lodger units, military and civilian personnel and naval assets such as HMS Scotia. We urgently need clarity on plans for this site. 
The Royal Navy has had an enduring presence in fight, stretching back to the Battle of Jutland and beyond. And it's extremely sad to see this legacy cut away and run down in such a discourteous way. The First Minister wrote to the Prime Minister yesterday to express her firm opposition to these cuts and to seek clarity on personnel numbers, unit moves, and also any financial support that will be provided to communities affected by closures. She also expressed concern about the MOD's failure to keep their promises to consult with the Scottish Government. I personally made every effort to meet MOD ministers before decisions were made, but they cancelled meetings on several occasions. No consultation took place even in the case of Fort George, where Scottish ministers have a direct interest in the operation of the site. And that shows a complete lack of respect for the Scottish Government's legitimate interests in these decisions and that they have, uh, where they have a clear impact uh, on Scotland and indeed the Scottish economy. Uh, the Scottish Government does not accept that uh, Monday's announcement is the end of the story. And I'll work closely with local authorities most directly affected to agree next steps. I've asked officials to establish a working group for this purpose and also to campaign against these decisions. I'm also keen to work with parliamentarians from all parties as there's a clear interest throughout the Chamber in retaining, I would hope, a strong defence footprint across Scotland. The announcement contained very little detail on unit moves and personnel numbers. In recent years, the MOD committed to increase numbers of regular personnel in Scotland to 12,500, an increase from roughly 10,000 as it currently stands, as an attempt to remedy what were ever-decreasing numbers. However, no mention was made of this figure, and I'm very concerned that this commitment will no longer be met. There's also a clear risk that in the midst of the chaos of this statement that army units will be diminished or quietly moved out of Scotland altogether. There are other risks on the horizon to the reserves and the training estate with further cutbacks planned. As I said, Presiding Officer, Scotland has long held a strong connection to the military and we cannot let down areas like the Highlands, Fife and other strong recruiting grounds where this has been torn away. We must unite as a chamber to sustain a strong defence footprint here in Scotland and to that end I'd ask for support from members across the chamber. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. The Cabinet Secretary will now take questions on the issues raised in his statement. I intend to allow around 20 minutes for questions, after which we will move on to the next item of business. It would be helpful if members who wish to ask a question press the request to speak, and speak buttons now. And the shorter the questions, I keep saying it, the more questioners we get in. Mr Mountain, please. Presiding Officer, I'd like to thank the Cabinet Secretary for early sight of his speech. I'd like to declare an interest. The interest is that my father was a soldier, I was a soldier, and my son is a soldier. And so I recognise the recent announcements made by the Defence of State was the latest step in ensuring our armed forces have the best facilities, not only for training, but also for their families. What we have to accept is the Army reduced from 1980s figures of about 150,000 regular soldiers to the 82,000 we have now. Many famous regiments were lost, including the one that my family and I served in. But the UK government's commitment to an effective defence remains strong. We've got two new aircraft carriers being built in Scotland, eight new frigates being built in Scotland, a new fleet of P-8 patrol aircraft being based in Scotland, £100 million being invested in Scotland at Lossiemouth, no reduction in Scottish regiments, which form 10% of the armed services, which will be based in Scotland. None of these would have been achieved if we'd Scotland had been independent. What we heard on Monday was a gradual and planned reduction in the defence estate, allowing our servicemen and families that loyally support them to have the best access to training areas and facilities. So I would like to ask the SNP government if they would now accept the need to firstly support the services and to use a quote that was used yesterday by Michael Matheson in relation to another service to become fit for the needs of the future. And secondly, to work with us towards finding a way of making the redundant defence estate an asset where possible for local communities. Cabinet Secretary. I, think I recognise um, in Edward Mountain's initial uh, contribution the interest, the very direct interest he has in the armed forces. I think that led me to hope and expect that what we would see would be something other than total and unquestioning support for the moves of the Conservative government and the cuts which have now been proposed. Uh, and also more of an interest, and actually I don't know how many members, uh, assisting members, serving members of armed forces uh, Mr Mountain has spoken to recently, but they will tell him, I'm sure, they are sick to the back teeth of the uncertainty that has been given by this government. 
shifted around in the previous basing review, told you're going to one place then to another. How does he expect members of the armed forces to try and plan family life around that? Children in the schools. The school at Fort George, it says Fort George, half of the pupils are from Fort George. What's going to happen to that school? So he asked if I will support uh, the services. Of course, that's the very reason why I've made the statement. What I would ask him is, rather than just slavishly reading out the latest press release from the Conservative government, will he not get behind the armed forces properly and oppose these cuts? Rhoda Grant, please. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for a prior sight of the statement? I also am disappointed at the outcome of these decisions. It's a very difficult time for the communities who depend on those bases. The base jobs will go, but also so too will jobs within those communities. We've seen areas that have had bases closed in the past um, impact on public services because they suffer from a lack of um, staff due to the absence of service personnel's partners who actually staff our schools and hospitals in those areas. Can I ask what discussion the Scottish Government have had with the MOD about safeguarding these communities and assets? And have they set up a pace in each of the areas affected? And have they invited the MOD to be part of those partnerships in order to mitigate as far as possible the negative impacts of those closures in Scotland? Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Hey, can I thank uh, Rhoda Grant for her question and also say I agree with much of what she said in relation to the impact this will have on local communities. In relation to PACE, I should say that we have already been in contact with the local authorities affected. We intend to take that further by, as I've mentioned, having a working group to establish how we work through the proposals uh, which are here. Um, I've had discussions directly with uh, two of the local authorities. We didn't know, of course, where the uh, cuts were going to be felt, so we, we were not taken into the conference by the MOD or the uh, Westminster Government and for that reason we have not had the contact from the MOD that we've asked for. I had a meeting with Mark Lancaster some months ago when this facing review was first announced and I asked for proper consultation. There's not a single recorded instance in the last 10 years, nine years, of the Scottish Government being taken into the conference of the UK Government and betraying that conference by making it public. I offered that private space to be there to see if he could discuss uh, how some of these challenges could be met, and that was not taken up. A series of farcical attempts to hold meetings with the relevant minister, a letter from the First Minister to the Secretary of State to try and get a meeting off the ground. And of course, the way it eventually happened was to be given a courtesy call after the announcement had been made. So that prevented some of the discussions which Rhoda Grant rightly says should be taking place. But it is my intention to make sure that we have as inclusive uh, a, as possible an approach if there are other Conservative members, for example, who are not willing to just slavishly toe the line and actually challenge some of these things, and that would be useful as well if you could have all parties involved in this. But I do give my commitment that the Scottish Government will engage with the local authorities, pace where it's necessary, certainly we would offer that, uh, that assistance, uh, and also I would hope that we get continuing support from the Labour benches in relation to those activities. Marie Todd, be followed by Douglas Ross. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The announcement from the UK Government that Fort George will close means that the Black Watch will no longer have a permanent presence in the Highlands of Scotland. The Armed Forces will of course continue to visit us for training exercises, to use the bombing ranges and the controversial Trident nuclear submarines will continue their presence in our waters. This announcement will result in the loss of 20 million a year to the Highland economy. Over 700 jobs. I, I'm sorry, Ms. Todd. I do want short questions. I know your heart is in this, but as other people want to question. Okay. In a part of the country which has suffered depopulation. No, question. Will the Scottish Government join me in asking again that the UK Government should honour its commitment to permanently base the Black Watch at Fort George? And should the closure go ahead, what can the Scottish Government do to mitigate the potential social and economic impacts? Thank you very much. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, we've made that uh, point already. I can assure the member, uh, Presiding Officer, we've made that point that uh, Fort George should continue, not least because uh, of the historic connection that's been there. And we will continue to make that case. That was the uh, part of the purpose behind the establishment of the working group. So I can give that member uh, the assurance uh, and also say that we've met with uh, Highland Council. Uh, we made a joint statement about the need to avoid exactly this outcome. And I have to say, I can never remember a time in previous uh, strategic defence reviews where a base has been scheduled for closure 16 years 
uh, and perhaps two or three SDSRs away from the actual effect of it. The real issue is when, of course, uh, the personnel will move away from the space. So I can uh, assure the member I will take these issues up both in concert with Highland Council and to the uh, MOD, and if we can manage to get a meeting eventually with the UK ministers. Thank you. Douglas Ross, to be followed by Bruce Crawford. The Cabinet Secretary did not utter the word Kinloss once in his statement this afternoon, which I think is a shameful omission by him, because, as the BBC reported in August this year, the SNP has raised concerns about the future of Kinloss Barracks in Murray. Murray MP Angus Robertson says he has been told by an impeccable I would source like a question, that the Ministry please, of Defence, Mr. Ross. the former air station, could be closed. So could I ask the Cabinet Secretary, does he accept that that reckless tweet from Angus Robertson for political motives has caused unnecessary anxiety amongst military personnel, their families and the local community. Right. And on reflection, the MP concerned should have had far more respect for the armed forces and the people of Murray. Cabinet Secretary. I think the question, I think it was a question that's just been asked, demonstrates how far removed this particular member was from the interests of the campaign group, the local authority and the other elected members who took up this issue and he refused. In fact, he... You've had your question, Mr Ross. In fact, he deserted the field. When the rest of us stayed to make sure that Kinloss would be saved, he deserted the field. He let down the people in the Alpha community and we helped save it. <laughs> when I say you've had your question, I mean it. Can I call Bruce Crawford, followed by David Stewart, please? Does the Cabinet Secretary share my concern and sadness at the closure of Meadowforth Barracks and Forthside Vehicle Maintenance Depot in Stirling will bring to an end a long and historic direct connection between Stirling and the military? And does he also agree with me that, uh, that I believe that the decision to dispose of Forthside, together with the recent job losses announced by HSBC, strengthens the case for the go-ahead of the transformational Stirling and Clackmannanshire City deal? which can help redevelop and re reinvigorate the fourth side site. Cabinet Secretary. I do share uh, the member's sadness. I'm well aware, of course, Stirling uh, forms part of my constituency as well, of the very long connections, not least through the Argyll and Sutherland Highlanders, uh, with Stirling. There's a huge connection in the Stirling area and a great deal of sadness around the area because of this uh, closure. And also, as the member mentioned, some of the other functions which are currently carried out. I should say, uh, whilst the UK government seems content to hollow out our armed forces, the Scottish government will work towards uh, trying to achieve a city deal with both uh, Stirling and Clackmannanshire in order that we can help rebuild, perhaps fill the hole from some of that economic loss and do the constructive thing. And what we'll do uh, in relation to that is what the UK government has not done, which is consult with the UK government how we go about doing that. We're constantly asked by members on this side for us to work with the UK government. We try to do that. They've got nothing to say when their own government refuses to do it. David Stewart, who followed by Willie Rennie. Uh, thank you, President Officer. What assessment has the Scottish Government made of the economic and social effects of the closure of Fort George? And what forward strategy has the Tenants Historic Environment Scotland developed to keep Fort George open as a tourist icon post-2032? And finally, President Officer... No, that's sufficient. Thank you, thank you Secretary. Uh, these very issues are the ones that we sought to discuss with the MOD and with UK ministers, and we've been unable to do that. I will happily, if the member wants, provide them with the different requests that we've made for meetings to try and discuss that. We have had some discussions with Highland Council, who are equally concerned. I've mentioned the school in particular, but he's right to say there's a huge economic impact in the area. So any further information that we can get, as we try to get some consultation, some discussion with the MOD, we will certainly pass on to the member. And of course, uh, the local council will continue to be involved. Willie Rennie, followed by Gordon MacDonald, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer, and thanks to the Minister for an advanced copy of his statement. Um, he's made reference to Lucas uh, Station in my constituency. Um, and if the Fort George announcement does proceed, the Black Watch will be looking for a new headquarters. Will he meet with me to consider the possibility of headquartering the Black Watch in Lucas and Fife, its traditional recruiting grounds? Cabinet Secretary. I'm happy to meet with the member, of course, to discuss the general implications of this. But I would make the point that, yes, it is the case. If, as a member describes, Fort George is closed, then you'll see the Black Watch essentially evicted from the traditional home and looking for somewhere else. I think that's a scandalous uh, treatment of the Black Watch, given its historic um, position and also its location in the Highlands. Uh, it will have the, the implication, as I say, of adding to the fact that nearly or more than half of the Royal Regiment of Scotland is now going to have to get on the move. About three years after we were told 
The basing review, sorry, the review that was previously announced was going to provide certainty for armed forces. But in relation to the specific point uh, the member makes, I'm more than happy to meet with him. Gordon MacDonald, we follow by Jackson Carlow. The announcement on Monday by the MOD that both the Redford Cavalry and Infantry Barracks were to close by 2022 will have a massive impact on local businesses, shops, schools and services in and around the Collington area of my constituency. In the run-up to an independence referendum, the UK Government highlighted that the defence presence generates economic benefits for communities throughout Scotland through jobs, contracts and requirements for supporting services. Given the potential no, no impact question, this please. will have question. in my constituency, this question. is the question. Given the potential economic impact this will have in my constituency, does the cabinet secretary agree that it is not acceptable that the UK government had no discussions with the Scottish government prior to this announcement? Cabinet secretary. I do agree with the member, and it seems that everybody else, apart from the Conservative members in the Chamber, agree there is a scandal, there was no consultation. Uh, that, of course, there's going to be an impact in that part of Edinburgh. Certainly, the, Ref uh, the Redford Barracks, I uh, grew up in Edinburgh, everyone uh, knows about the Redford Barracks, it's been there for many years, and its closure, if they can achieve that, given what's happened or not happened yet in, in relation to Craigie Hall, will be very damaging. All the more reason why there should have been that discussion, and all the more reason why that discussion should take place now. Jackson Carlo, please, followed by Mark Griffin. Uh, in recognising the sincerity of the Minister's own interest in the armed forces, can I ask what specific experience or expertise the Scottish Government has to determine either the defence estate required or the actual defence needs of the United Kingdom? And given that this will be at best limited, to ask what the ultimate objective of this statement actually is today? Cabinet Secretary. It would appear from the question that's been asked that Jackson Carlow sees no role for the Scottish Government in relation to this review, the impact on local communities, the economic dislocation, and he also must assume from Jackson Carlow's statement there should be no interest in the Scottish Government or any member of the Scottish Parliament in the welfare and the interests of serving members of the armed forces. I think that's a terrible indictment of the limited approach of the Conservatives in this Parliament. We will continue to be concerned and we will continue to try and work with the UK Government. Very difficult when they refuse to even talk and perhaps it would have been better if Jackson Carlow had actually contained that total lack of consultation and prior discussion rather than trying to make some puerile point. Mark Griffin, please, followed by Andy Whiteman. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, if the UK Government does decide to force ahead with these base closures, can I ask if these sites will transfer to the Crown Estate after being declared surplus? And so will they then, under the new developers, become the responsibility of the Scottish Government? Cabinet Secretary. Can I thank Mark Griffin for his question, but I'm afraid I have to say the same as I said to a previous member. We haven't had that discussion. We have no idea what's in the mind of the MOD or UK ministers. There's not been the courtesy of a single meeting to try and explore these issues, including the one that he rightly raises. And of course, from some of the sites, we have a very legitimate interest, like Fort George, where the Scottish Government has got the interest through Historic Environment Scotland, uh, but other areas as well. I did make the plea, I should say to the member, to Mark Lancaster all those months ago, that there may be an interest in securing land for the provision of veterans housing from land that's made surplus to requirements. Again, no consultation on that. So I can assure the member that as we get more information, if we get more information, then I'm more than happy to pass it on to him. Thank you. Andy Whiteman, followed by Richard Lockhead. Uh, can I thank the Minister for advance sight of his statement. Given that sites such as Redford and Glencorse cover extensive areas and given the pressing need uh, for affordable housing, will the Scottish Government urge the MOD to do what's already happening in England? where the MOD plans to transfer five large sites to the Homes and Community Agency and seek a commitment from the UK Government that the ownership of Redford and other sites will be transferred to Scottish ministers who will then seek to develop them for wider community benefit in partnership with local authorities. Cabinet Secretary. I made the point uh, to uh, Defence Ministers, as I've just mentioned, that transferring, <coughs> in some cases, uh, land or buildings to the Scottish Government would enable us to provide housing uh, with that. However, I do think we should not miss the point, first of all, in relation to Redford, the uh, listed nature of some of the buildings which are there, uh, but also the fact that there's the economic dislocation. Uh, the number of people that are actually paying into the local economy, that are helping local services, that's going to be the massive loss, whether or not we are subsequently able to produce additional housing. So the point the members uh, made, I have made to UK, UK ministers, and I will continue to do so. Thank you. Richard Lockhead, followed by Mike Rumbles. Cabinet Secretary joined me in paying tribute to the Murray Economic Partnership that I attended, as did Highlands and Islands Conservative Douglas Ross, MSP, on occasion, albeit clearly he had covered up his ears for the role they played in saving the Kinloss Barracks. And will he now ask his officials 
to liaise with MOD to find ways in which the spare capacity on the Kinloss site that has been available since the RF base was closed by the Tories can be used for job creation in local or new businesses? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, can I say, first of all, yes, we will uh, uh, look into that uh, question and come back to the member as to, as to progress. And also, if I could also thank the member and other elected members in that area, the ones that were actually willing to fight uh, for the future of Kinloss. And as I say, to question whether it was right to raise this as an issue, obviously, uh, Richard Lockhead must have been aware, and that's why he was concerned, of a senior MOD official briefing the chief executive at Murray Council that Kinloss was at risk. Obviously, Douglas Ross was unaware of that because he was so disengaged from the campaign and deserted the field at the very moment where people in Kinloss were looking to the elected members to try and save Kinloss, which we did, and he ran away from. Mike Rumbles, be followed by Graeme Day. Could the minister inform the chamber uh, and uh, his plans how many major army bases there would be in Scotland if we left the United Kingdom? Cabinet Secretary. Hey, maybe we're perhaps just worth reminding the member, we're discussing the UK government's commitment to cut the armed forces. Mm -hmm. uh, and it would be useful if you could remember, ask a question that was genuinely about that. Obviously, he has no genuine interest in any of those issues. This was the UK government three years after a, a review into where the disposition of forces were going to be in Scotland, now going further and cutting that back once again. The member has not a word to say of concern about that, which I think is deeply unfortunate. So it may rest with the Scottish government and other members that are genuinely interested in their armed forces to take those issues forward. Graeme Day. The plans to dispose of the airfield at Condor will do nothing to address long-held con held concerns locally that 4-5 Commando is destined eventually to move to the south of England, something that was actually intended to happen in 2013. Can I ask whether the Cabinet Secretary, given his close personal connection to the Marines, shares those concerns and whether he, like me, wonders who might want to buy an airfield within a Marine base given the likely security restrictions? Cabinet Secretary. I think that's a very good point. Anybody familiar with 4-5 Commando and the airfield there will wonder what the rationale is behind that particular move. As they'll wonder about Fort George, I can't see a huge potential deceit being received in Fort George at any time soon, not least given the restrictions. Not in the case that the members mentioned security restrictions, but certainly the architectural restrictions which will apply there. I have no idea as to what the thinking was from the MOD behind selling off the airfield at Condor but keeping 4-5 Commando there. I have no idea because they refuse to discuss it, but I am willing to commit to the member that we will try to find out exactly what the purpose is, whether there's any likelihood of a receipt, and of course, whether there's any likelihood of reversing this uh, absurd decision. Thank you very much. That concludes questions. I know it's quite hard on members, but that meant everyone who wanted to ask a question got to ask a question. Something of a world record in here. I'll pause for a few minutes before the next item of business.